just want to cover some thoughts, some things I've been poking around in my mind. First, um, I'd like to touch on the dual chargers. A lot, no, not a lot of people have them, but uh, actually I don't know how many people would have them. Personally, uh, I think every car should be standard with a dual charger. Either way, um, most people just don't, if they do have them, don't use them on a regular basis. Well, it's always a good idea maybe to exercise it once in a while, make sure it's still working, so you don't just drive up to a high-powered station one day when you really need it and find out, oh, great, uh, my, uh, my dual charger isn't working and you're only stuck on the 40 amp. So if you have a high-powered station at home, now you don't need to charge at the highest power every day. You're actually throwing some money away if you're doing that. You're going to want to turn your charge speeds down in order to cut down on resistive heat loss in the wiring. Heat resistance builds up in the wiring. The more amps you're pulling, the more heat the wire is generating. At a certain point, uh, you're losing considerable amount of money that it, as heat in the wiring and then you would going into your car. Now, if you're on just using your regular UMC or charging at 40 amp, you know, or just on a 40 amp circuit, that magic number is going to be about 30 to 32 amp, which is kind of the medium point between uh, recutting your heat losses and then reducing the amount of time that the car's electronics are staying fully awake and active, wasting energy in that way. When you're on a dual charger, that magic number is kind of a toss up. Now, if you're on, if it, if that dual charger or dual powered station is on a 100 amp circuit, meaning you can charge at a maximum of 80 amps, the highest you'd want to charge at, if you're not in a hurry, would be 60 amps to cut down on those heat losses, or 41. Where do I come up with the number 41? If you charge at a, on a dual charging a capable station and charge only at 40 amps, you're only using a single charger. But if you go to 41 amps, it kicks in the second charger. And what it does is instead of pumping 40 amps into say your main charger and then one amp on the second charger, it splits the load. So basically it would put 20.5 amps, roughly there's gonna be a little leniency, layway, you know, within an amp or so. It'll put 20.5 amps onto the main charger and 20.5 amps onto the second charger. Thus exercising both chargers and since both chargers aren't running at their maximum, it's also cutting heat losses in that manner as well. So that was my thought on dual chargers. So exercise them once in a while. Uh, 41 amp is pretty good if you're going to be using a higher power. If you don't need your car right away, still turn it down to say 30 or 32 or even a little bit lower yet, but 30 or 32 is still good if it'll get you charged by the time you need it the next day. Next, I want to just touch on some thoughts I had about um, the use of LiDAR on autonomous cars. And LiDAR basically is a method of object detection in a way, I'm not sure the best way to describe it, but it basically beams out a laser and records what that laser is bouncing off of. And the neat thing is the use of it on autonomous cars or any car in general. And in fact, I'm, I, I can't believe Google hasn't started doing this. Maybe they have, they just haven't said on their uh, Google Earth, you know, the cars that drive around all over pretty much every road they can find and uh, take pictures for Google Street View. Um, they really should be using LiDAR uh, to help map as well if they are not. And what this is doing is creating a 3D representation of the world around it. So as a car is driving down the road, its LiDAR is going off every direction. It's recording everything it sees in three dimensions. What's really neat about this is it's mapping the world. You get enough of these cars out there and enough of this LiDAR, you put it in one collective giant massive database such as Google Earth and now you have a quite literal 3D map of the world. You can see everything, every tree, 
well, almost everything. There are some limitations, of course. But it's just, just the thought of that blows my mind. Just seeing what, you know, some of the information that was put out at the uh, CES uh, and showing uh, some of the, the, uh, the, the seminars showing what an electric car sees, or excuse me, what an autonomous car sees as it's going down the road with its LiDAR, LiDAR was just impressive. It sees the other cars. It sees barricades. It sees the trees. It sees the leaves on the trees. And I don't mean just as a picture. I mean, it's a 3D representation. It's, this is just impressive um, the amount of things that, that this could open up. I mean, it, could, it can open up just, well, anything. I mean, you log on to Google Earth, you, you might be able one day to sit down with your uh, 3D glasses or, or with, even with your, your, your phones or a tablet. You put on those, uh, those neat um, Google, Google Glass, no, not Google Glass, uh, Google Cardboard uh, goggles to, to watch your phone and you can, you can, you know, sit down in a chair and as you're looking around, you could see a 3D modeling of the world around you. In fact, I think that might be partially how um, the 3D imaging on some of these mapping programs do manage to get, you know, the, how high a house is and be able to demonstrate that. You know, you slide your fingers one way and you can kind of see from a different direction and actually see the whole representation. So I just wanted to say that. I mean, I thought that was, that, that kind of just blew my mind watching this video um, of what the autonomous car sees as it's going down the road. It was just, it was absolutely impressive. It was amazing. And um, I can't wait until uh, it gets expanded more. Just imagine having almost every car on the road just mapping the world around us. And uh, I, I guess that could also be incorporated in a way also into actual photos uh, to be able to make visual rep not just you know little dots to represent the 3d object but actually have full color take you know incorporate the full color pictures into what the lidar is seeing as well to be able to mold that around into those 3d images and i mean it's history um, think of it like almost star trek okay i want to call up uh a computer call up New York 2016 and then boom all of a sudden you have a full color 3d modeling of all of New York as it looked in 2016 on that particular day and I mean eventually we'll have enough cars running around with LiDAR where everything almost everything on a daily basis could be recorded and documented People could be looking back, you know, 200 years from now, they might be looking back into 2016 or 2017, 2018. And uh, not just that, or uh, uh, say there was a terrorist attack on a, a building. Well, tap into that database of all that LIDAR and imaging, and boom, now you can see that terrorist walking into the building and identify who he was, or she was, or it, you know, I'm sure at some point we're going to have it's, well, we kind of already do have it's, I'm not going to even touch on that subject though, but it could be a robot or a droid going in, boom, well, it just blows my mind, the, the technology that's just, it's just coming out, it's exponential on how fast it's growing, so that's it, just um, minor thoughts for the day, uh, Hmm. Have this other weird thought: uh, doing kung fu on a hoverboard. <laughs>